Last week, I talked about Vult and Galton. Galton, I made no apologies for saying I didn't like. Vult, I find a boring prick. Normal services review is, re is resumed this week because I shall be giving a lecture on Sigmund Freud and then another on William James. And they, I will admit, are two of my great favourites. I will try and share my enthusiasm uh, for them with you. But if you're impervious to their charms, and my enthusiasm, so be it. You must choose your own favourites. But I'm starting with Freud, and I'll be talking. Oh, I, I, as you remember, I gave a lecture on Freud to you all. Do you remember it last year? And I will assume that you have remembered every word and nuance of that lecture. Now I shall be talking about psychoanalytic theory, but particularly Freud's theory of humour, and why Freud's theory of humour is still important. Because, remember, I talked about Hobbes' <coughs> theory of humour, and Locke's theory, Locke's theory of humour, mentioned Shaftesbury, because I think having a concrete topic like humour, a fun topic like humour, can bring some of these abstract thoughts to life. And I hope to be doing the same today with Freud. I won't go into the details of Freud's life and the basic ideas of Freud's theory because, of, because I did that last week. But what I want to do is pick up on some of those things. And in many respects, Freudian theory was a reaction against the orthodox psychology which was starting to develop in Germany and then the United States. Freud felt there was something wrong. He, he, he read some of the early psychology, but he wasn't convinced by it. He, he read books, as we will see. Now, Freud developed his ideas not in another university. It wasn't Wundt in Leipzig, uh, 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 Galton setting up the, 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 his... his uh, chair in, the, in London University, and then we'll see uh, William James over in Harvard. Freud wanted to work in, in the university. He wanted to work in the University of uh, at Vienna. But he never got a position. Now, you might think, this is strange. Why didn't one of the greatest figures in intellectual history Someone whose name now we're all familiar with. Get it, didn't, couldn't get a job. I mean, I've got a job in the university. You see, my colleagues have got jobs. Hundreds of people work in the university in Britain. Why didn't Freud? You have to go back to the days. When Freud lived in Vienna, It wasn't either a safe place, but certainly not a comfortable place for someone of Freud's ethnicity. Freud was Jewish, and there were legal restrictions against Jews entering certain professions, and Freud always suspected that the reason he kept getting refused again and again for a position, even a part-time position, in the University of Vienna, was because they didn't want Jews. And he found himself in the early years of the 20th century working really in isolation. He was a doctor, he trained as a doctor, actually he wanted to be a lawyer, but there was a, a quota on how many Jews could go into the law, so he became a doctor. And he was working in isolation cut off from other academics. Seeing his patients, 
associating with a small group of like-minded people, people who are more like rightly, and developing this strange, incredibly brilliant, and at times silly, theory about in motives. At the root, Freud was saying, distrust what people say about themselves. But most people, in fact everyone, has hidden motives. They do things for reasons which they cannot admit to themselves. And for Freud, most of the hidden motives were sexual. And as he developed his theories in the early years, so he read widely. As he got older, he didn't read so widely. He tended just to read, uh, as he got older, uh, works by his follow followers and works of literature. But when he was younger, he read voraciously psychology, physiology. Actually, he trained as a physiologist as well. And he criticised Funt. He read Funt and he criticised. He criticised the sort of psychology Wundt was developing, the psychology of consciousness. And his criticism at root was quite a simple one. So, well, yes, Wundt was looking at what we consciously think about. Probably quite good at doing that. We'll see in the next lecture, William James thought he wasn't even very good at doing that. But Freud said, this is only the surface of people. Yeah, we can study consciousness. But what Wundt doesn't study, and what the other experimentalists won't study, are the hidden secrets of humans. The unconscious. Things we don't know. Things not which crop up in our mind and we can report, but things which we keep out of our mind and never report. Freud, this was the fundamental flaw of the sort of psychology which was being developed out of Wundt's laboratory. <coughs> it wasn't interested in the deeper motives of humans. It just stayed on the surface and plunged in. Oh, I forgot. One passage in what was known as his introductory lectures, Freud wrote about Wundt quite directly. And he mentioned that Wundt had established the method of what he called association experiment. And these association experiments. Experimentalist presents the subject with a word, and the subject has to respond to that word. And the experimentalist will calculate how long it's taken for the, the, the subject to respond, and to see what type of response is given. And the experimentalist observe the chain of responses. For instance. If I were to say to you, if I were to shout at you, and you've got to say the first word which comes into your head, cat. Mouse. Mouse. Notice there was a little pause, and then counting mouse. Now, Wundtian uh, would say, yes, and notice also that it's another animal. Uh, uh, we, so in fact, uh, what, what has happened is, uh, uh, the, the person is, is thinking, the word, initial word gets you thinking of animal, and the word comes and you respond with another animal. Okay. If I now said, mouse. Come on, come on! Cheese. Sorry? Cheese. Cheese. And you've now gone from an animal to 
something you associate with a mouse and its way of life. Anyway. Now, this is Freud talking about this sort of thing. What the experimentalist does. It is then possible to study the interval that passes between the stimulus and the reaction. How for the second one, you took longer than the first one. The nature of the answer given as a reaction. Animal, food. And possible errors when the same experiment is repeated later. Can you remember what you said when I said mouse? And you would say, yes, I remember. I said computer pad. No, you didn't. And so that's what he means. Of course you would say that. OK. Now, Freud said, it's all very well to do that. Maybe quite interesting, and it was a bit patronising towards Wundt, Nothing about the deeper meaning of the terms. Maybe sometimes when you set up the chains of association, this was Freud's idea. But what you say may appear on the surface quite unexceptional. But if you look closely, maybe it indicates something hidden, some secret about the mind. And that sort of method of association was one which psychoanalysts were using with their patients. The patient would be lying on the couch, relaxed. And the, the psychotherapist, the psychoanalyst would say, Tell me the first thing which comes into your mind. Cat. Oh, my mother. Mouse. Oh, my mother. Oh, so on and so on. It, it would be, and you'll say, ah, oh, there's a significance. We're getting close to what you can't admit. And psychoanalysis, of course, was the thing. <coughs> bubble of hidden motives, saying that we all have hidden motives, we all have <coughs> desires, wishes, shameful secrets which we push from our minds. And the unconscious is that which is repressed. Repression is the act of pushing something away from the mind, denying, if you want, that you have that thought. Having a secret from, your, from yourself. And according to Freud's theory, the desires which are really pushed away from the mind, above all, are sexual and aggressive desires. A psychoanalyst would have great fun with your response of a mouse. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and above all, what we repress, according to Freud, are desires which you can trace right back to childhood. Male erotic desires for the mother. Aggressive desires for the father, and the opposite for females. And repression is evident as denial. So that if you suggest to someone, oh, you have this desire, this hidden de and it's a hidden desire, they don't just say, oh, I wonder if I do. That's very interesting. I say, no, no, I don't. Oh. How disgusting of you! No, 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 no! And it's a way in which we deceive ourselves. But according to Freud's theory, repression is never complete. What is repressed, what is pushed from the mind, if it's a strong, rooted desire, will seek expression, will work its way back into consciousness, often disguised, disguised as some other object. 
and it will return in dreams, in slips of the tongue, and of course in neuroses. And therefore, the aim of psychoanalysis wasn't just to cure neuroses, although it would have been, it was, but it was to find generally the hidden motives of each person. Let them understand themselves. Give each patient insight into themselves so that they could then not just understand their desires, but, but get a check on their desires and prevent them in the case of new neuroses, from upsetting and disturbing their lives. And psychoanalysis, when Freud was writing in the early years of the 20th century, was just, was just a small, was confined to a small group of fellow uh, like-minded people in Vienna. But in the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, it spread. It spread throughout Europe, and particularly in the United States in the mid 20th century. The rise of psychoanalysis is quite incredible. And mostly this happened outside of universities. Psychoanalysis, one of its methods, it had a, a number of different methods, was, as I say, like the method of free association, rather like the experimental study of stimulus reactions. And maybe the psychoanalyst would set up the association and then get the patient to free associate cat, mouse, cheese, 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 breakfast, breakfast, my mother made breakfast. <laughs> with the assumption that there were hidden motives in the chain. And also, if there are long pauses, this is a sign of difficulty. The psychoanalyst would have said, when you paused and said cheese, cheese wasn't your first response. There was something <laughs> censoring your first response. Always on the left. It, it, Freud said the same for slips of tongue. When the wrong word comes out, that word will be freighted with meaning, covered in meaning. It will be because you couldn't say the right word because it was associated with something we needed to repress. Wundt said slips of the tongue. It's just when we're tired, we tend to make associations because we're too tired, we don't work out the meanings of words, we just go by the sound of words. So two similar sounding words get confused when we're tired. <coughs> Service of Freud. But there's depth reasons why we make mistakes. particularly when the word which is unsaid, which is not said, becomes significant, and the forgotten word becomes associated with a hidden desire. Now, you can see these very different perspectives. What consciousness is just, we sometimes get wrong associations. Freud, the wrong association, indicate or a surface manifestation of something going on beyond, below the surface. And Freud was quite dogmatic about this. In his book on slips of the tongue, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, he said that all slips of the tongue are caused by hidden motives. Mental life, he said, is strictly determined. And just as he said in the interpretation of dreams, his great book on dreaming, he said, all dreams are wish fulfillments, are caused by the unconscious. Actually, during the First World War, he revises because he said some dreams can be caused by fears. 
and he realised this because of some of the young soldiers coming back from the front had dreadful dreams, which clearly were wishes. But Freud's impulse here was to try and explain everything in terms of hidden motives. And that's what got him into trouble. Because there are problems with this way of thinking. Remember the lecture right at the start when I talked about Popper, and Popper, the great philosopher of, of science, going to work as a young man with, 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 with the psychoanalyst, and being rather uh, disappointed and baffled but that but whatever happened, the psychoanalyst took it as a proof. And critics of psychoanalysis say there is a problem of proof. First of all, there are the exceptions. Some slips of the tongue do seem to be caused by confusing similar words. As once said, this is likely to happen when we're tired. Perhaps that does happen. In fact, there is some evidence that it does. And some dreams maybe are not hidden wishes. Well, Freud conceded that. But maybe some dreams just are meaningless. But the, the brain is sleeping and just bizarre jumbles of words occur. And maybe the psychoanalyst is always trying to find some significance. And what happens is if you look for significance and you go further and further, you'll find it but you can't prove it. And the psychoanalyst says, ah, oh, but you have to be trained to find the hidden symbolism. And if you look far enough and deep enough, then you'll find it. And the opponent will say, well, doesn't that mean you're always right? How could you ever prove it wrong? What do you expect not to happen? And the critic, like Popper, says, this gives license to psychoanalysts always to prove their own theories. And therefore, the theories are not scientific. Now, Freud thought his theory was scientific. He didn't like that sort of criticism. Some modern psychoanalysts say, yes, this isn't science. This is interpretation. This is trying to find things, almost like a novelist find things. To search for hidden depths. You can't, there's not a matter of proving. It's a finding and discovering. And then there's the other problem. That as a treatment, particularly for neuroses, psychoanalysis doesn't seem to be particularly effective. It's not ineffective. But it takes hours and years sometimes, and it's not particularly effective. If, if anyone suffers from a neurosis and you were asked to ask me, well, what sort of treatment should you get? I would probably say, try first behavior, behavioral methods, cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, because it doesn't take so long. It just tries to train you to new habits. And it doesn't go in for self-understanding. And sometimes the results are quite good, but it's certainly cheaper and quicker. But the psychoanalyst would say, regardless of curing a particular psychological problem, psychoanalysis will give you insight into yourself. You will know yourself better your strengths and your weaknesses, because you are directed to think about yourself in new ways. That's an ongoing dilemma. Is psychoanalytic thinking scientific? If it's not scientific, does that mean it's worthless? If it's not even particularly effective, does that mean it's worthless? Or does it mean that it's rich 
and that it tells you something about the self as a unique person. And because it tells you something about the unique person, you can't formulate general laws, uh, scientific laws. Now, the status of psychoanalysis today is that it's largely ignored in experimental psychology. It's always been ignored there. There are some, some cognitive theories, very small number, who are impressed with the concept of repression, pushing ideas out of the minds, but don't take on board Freud's specific arguments about sexual development and about what Freud said we need to repress. But strangely, these days, psychoanalytic ideas, Freud's ideas, are incredibly popular and influential in other parts of the social sciences, in sociology and cultural studies where Freudian ideas are used to suggest that we can become irrationally uh, attracted to particular sorts of ways of life and ideas. But our unconscious leads us to socially odd sorts of beliefs. So it's very strange that psychoanalysis has, as it were, gone from psychology, although it never was firmly lodged in psychology, but is very, very important in cultural studies and sociology. You'll find some of my colleagues in the Department of Social Sciences in, in, in media studies and in uh, sociology as knowing more about Freud than my colleagues in psychology. And at root is this great <coughs> we say insight, or should we say vision, or should we say prejudice? I think vision is the word. The vision of human beings is full of self-deceit. That we are all complex beings. And look closely at every one of us and you'll find depths and hidden secrets which you'll miss if you just walk around in ordinary life. And that these hidden secrets are difficult to discover. We don't walk around, as it were, with a symbol saying, I have hidden secrets, I have a repressed desire to do, blah, blah, blah. We don't. We don't proclaim it. If we did, it wouldn't be a hidden secret. Now, all this is a prelude for what I'm going to say about Freud's theory of humour. Because the critics, and there are some very dedicated critics of Freud, people who seem obsessed with proving Freud wrong, wrong, and wrong again, and I've read the works of some of these most dedicated critics, and by and large, they totally ignore his theory of humour. And one reason they, got, they ignore it, I think, is because his theory of humour is not based on the sorts of exaggerations of his theory of slips of the tongue or his theory of dreams, which is easy to refute. The theory of dreams which said, oh, well, our dreams are sexual, it's very easy to point to some dreams and say, well, it's very hard to make out these are sexual. And the same with slips of the tongue. Well, maybe it was right. Sometimes when we're tired, <coughs> the wrong word just comes out. Big deal. But when we deal with humor, which I think is much more central to social life than slips of the tongue, or even dreams. If we look at humour, we can see that Locke and Hobbes and other theories <coughs> never got close to the centre of humour. They were too rational. There's something very odd about laughter. And what makes us laugh, Freud's theory emphasises, what makes us laugh is not at all obvious. 
We can get grains of truth from hops. We get pleasure out of other people's misfortunes and embarrassment. Hobbes doesn't really say why, except we feel superior to them. Not really very uh, convincing, and we're not conscious of any feeling of superiority. It doesn't happen that when you see someone fall over, you say, oh, suddenly I feel superior, and because I feel superior, now I'm smiling. Now, the laughter comes out too quickly. It doesn't seem to be an intervening sense of superiority. But Hobbes' theory of humour comes from a general theory of self-deceit and distrust. It's distrust of people. <coughs> Remember, Hobbes said everyone is nasty and selfish, as if we're looking and enjoying other people's misfortunes. And Freud, in some way, was similar, saying people aren't as nice as you think they are. We have these hidden motives, these sexual motives, these aggressive motives. And these motives are at variance with society. If we're going to have an organised social life, we have to contain, get a hold of these desires. And Hobbes said, well, we get a hold of our selfish desires only if we have an external authority. Freud said, no, no, no. What makes us get hold of our desires is not an external it's an internal authority. It's a sense of conscience. And if we're really going to get hold of our desires, we've got to understand our conscience. Not get rid of it, but understand it, show insight. Freud was a great person for freedom, but freedom with discipline and insight. What is in jokes and their relation to the unconscious? Again, it was written before Freud became famous. He wasn't a great man at this time. He was an unknown doctor working in Austria, in Vienna, shunned by the medical establishment. What was he? He said, at root, humour really is some sort of rebellion against the demands of society. Look, society makes demands on us. To live in society, we have to discipline what we want to do, our urges. Look at this situation now. For two hours, or virtually two hours, you have to sit quietly. For virtually two hours, I have to yak, yak, yak. We both must show discipline to do this. Why do we do it? Can't say it's because we really want to do it. We are all biologically created animals. Wouldn't it be fun, much more fun, giving, <coughs> giving way to our biological urges? Sex and aggression. Oh, if you can't have sex, isn't it lovely to thump things? Not give lectures and listen to lectures. But we have to discipline. We have to use that energy to discipline ourselves. And you, as you sit here, being so civilised and polite, you have to discipline all your aggression. You can't even think your aggression. You have to give rise to the social restrictions. You can't stand up and say to me, shut up! Well, you laugh when I say it. You laugh. Exactly. Remember that. But humour becomes a way of breaking the taboos, breaking through the restrictions, and saying things which are otherwise forbidden, 
but only if you say them, say, I was joking. So you can stand up and say, shut up, and then say, just joking, just seeing how the joke worked. And what the joke gives you is a momentary release from restriction. And this is why Freud's theory is often called a release theory. There's other release theories. You know, I mentioned the incongruity theory of Locke and the uh, superiority theory of Hobbes. And, and uh, Freud's is often called a release theory. And when people say, <coughs> Just joking. It's only just a joke. Freud's lesson is don't trust them. Often the joke, the just a joke, is more than a joke. Just as his book, Jokes, in some ways was an act of rebellion. It was one of the first books, serious books, written on jokes. Not on humour, but on telling jokes. And his book, Freud's book, the early 1900s, was full of Jewish jokes. They, these were jokes he loved to tell. And it doesn't seem remarkable now. But then, for a book aimed at respectable academics, and given the anti-Semitism which was current, to have a book full of Jewish jokes was itself an act of rebellion. That's not what proper gentlemen did. Now, there's a complicated argument in this book, and I'll try and explain it because it's an absolutely brilliant argument. <coughs> Now, the first step is to, is to explain how jokes work. What Freud called the joke work, or we could call it the linguistics of jokes. He goes through the words of jokes to say why they are funny and what is happening. The conceptual operations of jokes. And he say, Freud says, but if you take a joke to pieces, you often find that at one point, suddenly, there's a substitution of one set of meanings for another set of meanings. You can use a word or an image with two meanings, and your audience think you're using meaning one, but suddenly, almost when they're not looking like a magician, you switch to meaning two. There's the bathhouse joke. Two people meet outside of offices with over public bars when people didn't have any public bars. Uh, and one says to the other, who's coming out of the bathhouse, have you taken a bath? And the man coming out says, no, why? Has one been stolen? And meaning, take a bath has two meanings, one have a bath and the other to steal a bath. Not a particularly good joke, but Freud explains what's happened, two meanings with one phrase. And sometimes words condense meanings. It, this is a quote from literature of old men being in their anecdote age. Uh, uh, combining the word anecdote and dotage since being senile. And your anecdote age, dote age is when you get to that stage as an old man, you're just telling old stories with all the packs of every young person. That reminds me, when I was... No, no, no! no. <laughs> In some ways, this is like Locke's analysis of wit. Seeing similarities between things which are, are really different, but much more sophisticated than Locke. 
because it's with examples and actually it's a sophisticated analysis. This is the sort of thing Locke should have done. And Freud is much more sympathetic because he enjoys jokes. And he shows how they work. It's a brilliant bit of discourse analysis, really. Okay, so far so good. Does anyone want to <coughs> go over Freud's analysis of how a joke works? The switching of meanings. Okay? Then Freud makes a very important distinction. Two sorts of jokes. Innocent jokes and what he calls tendentious jokes. Innocent jokes are jokes which are just plays on words. Tendentious jokes are jokes which express emotions, often hidden emotions. But some jokes are just innocent jokes. They're just plays on words. You just make a pun. Or you play a cheerful little joke with a word with two meanings. Other jokes, and you will know some of these, will express taboo meanings, sexual meanings, aggressive meanings, and a lot of sexual jokes are aggressive jokes, sick jokes. Now here is the big difference from the analysis of dreams or the slips of the tongue. Because Freud is allowing that some jokes are just innocent. They don't interest the psychoanalyst at all. They don't concern uh, uh, hidden motives. But other jokes most certainly do. Why do we tell so many jokes about sex in the laboratories and so on? And Freud's big insight, and it's a huge insight, and like really big insights, it doesn't seem much when you say it, is that the tendentious joke, the sexual joke, the aggressive joke, normally has just the same structure, the same joke work, as the innocent joke. Take apart the sexual joke, Take apart the innocent play with words, and you'll find something very, very similar. What they differ in is their topic, not their structural meaning. But then, he says, we tend to laugh more at the tendentious jokes. Tell a dirty joke, and people will tend to laugh longer and louder than if it's basically the same joke, but just with plays on innocent meanings. You get smiles, and sometimes you get a mm, yeah. <laughs> But if you ask the people <coughs> who laugh why they're laughing at that joke, the tendentious joke, what do they say? They say, oh, because it's clever and they'll cite the joke work. Other studies, Freud didn't put it like this, but I'll put it like this, and other studies have confirmed it. Tell people dirty jokes, and they laugh at the dirty jokes, and you ask them why you're laughing, they never say, oh, I really like jokes about little willies, or I like jokes about big poos, or something like that. They don't. You're laughing, you're laughing. I just have to say, big poo. And because it's not meant to in a lecture, people laugh. It's a breaking of a taboo. But people hide the reason. They just say, it's just for joke work. Now, what this means, and here is Freud's great second big insight. It's a wonderful insight. If people laugh longer and louder at the dirty joke, and then if you ask them why they're laughing, they say, oh, it's just a joke work. Wasn't it clever? That means they are deceiving themselves. They don't know why they're actually laughing.
Their explanation cannot be true. And this means that humour, at least for laughter following a tendentious joke, involves self-deceit. What a brilliant insight. So simple. You will get the argument. And in my view, this is a brilliant theory which explains not just how jokes work, but why we are, and certainly adds real extra dimensions to both <coughs> Locke and Hobbes. And humor also, uh, uh, Freud also says, humor is social. We laugh together. People tell jokes one to another. And it's a way of getting social reassurance for our insecurities. And the way of getting social reassurance when you break a bond. We can go further and say, there seems here to be a morality of jokes. We want to break through taboos, but these are the taboos which in some ways we are preserving. They wouldn't be taboos if we couldn't rebel against them. And they wouldn't be taboos if we didn't rebel against them. And above all, we want to believe in the morality of our own humour. We don't say things like, I like laughing at jokes which demean women. I like laughing at jokes about poop. And Freud's basic premise seems to be supported. Because if you look at, go on to any website now about jokes, you'll find the topics of jokes are not evenly distributed throughout the world. But the topics of jokes are those which are socially not neutral. They're socially ones about which there's a lot of insecurity. Of race and sex and laboratories and sickness and death. Not many jokes about flowers or sunshine. But matters of shame and insecurity are matters of laughter. And they, they latch on to our own laughter. There's a study, uh, this is uh, by an experimentalist, where he had two sorts of jokes. It were, actually, it was the same joke, but it was either told of someone in a superior position mocking someone in an inferior position, or the person in the inferior position mocking the superior, like a pupil and teacher, teacher, pupil. <coughs> and some of half the respondents themselves had superior jobs of authority, and half had jobs of uh, Subordinate, subordinate jobs, and basically people enjoyed the joke when, when it was told as if it was someone from their position mocking the other person. So that if you were a pupil, you liked to joke about pupils mocking teachers. If you were a teacher, you liked to joke teachers mocking pupils. But all the time you said, oh, what you're laughing at is just for joke. I like it because it's a clever joke. Not because I like to see those in superior positions or those in uh, 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 non-superior positions to be mocked. And the results fitted perfectly Freud's theory. We don't recognize the emotional force of jokes. And similar to Hobbes, there's a not very credible <coughs> motive behind some of our laughter. Some hidden motives, hidden from ourselves. <coughs> OK. I've only got a little bit more. And it's for this reason sometimes we can find one version of a joke funny 
and another version of the identical joke. Not just not funny, but absolutely revolting. A few years ago, I did a study of jokes to be found on Ku Klux Klan websites. The <coughs> Ku Klux Klan, as you all know, is an extreme, violently racist group in the United States. Now, the strange thing is that some of the jokes they told were quite similar to jokes told in other circles uh, in, in non-racist forms. For, for instance, there's one, there's a bottom of a river jump. What do you call three lawyers at the bottom of a river? The answer is a good start. Ah, <coughs> uh, yes, there's someone who obviously has bought a house at some time and come across <laughs> a, a lawyer. And people, especially those who've had contact of lawyers, We'll laugh at There's a feminist version. What do you call three men at the bottom of the river? Ah, a good start. But there are also, if you could, if I told the Ku Klux Klan version, which not only is it's not even what a three blacks is using totally insulting terminology, you would be disgusted by it, even though the joke word is absolutely identical. And some of these jokes, these bottom of the river jokes, are similar to anti-Semitic jokes which were told in Freud's time. The, the, the newspaper which dear Freud read at one time reported a speech by the mayor of Vienna where he said, ah, he had a good way to baptise converted Jews. It was to hold their heads uh, under the baptismal water for ten minutes. Ha, ha, ha. It's the same joke. Uh, Simon Critchley has written a very interesting book about humour, but I think he's a bit too naive in some ways. He talks about well, a feminist joke and being a very clever joke, it, and it's one about uh, cutting men's thin to oh, I won't go in. But what he didn't realise, this same clever joke has its own racist versions as well, which you can find on Ku Klux Klan sites. And you can't just say, well, it's clever here, but it's not clever there. It's the same joke. And of course, there is a difference between the racist versions of these jokes and the, uh, the lawyer one or even the men one. Is by and large, the racist jokes are celebrated violence because they're laughing at situations which have actually been violent, where whites have massacred. In Freud's time, when Jews were being killed in Austria. The lawyers, no one is massacring the lawyers, even though they probably felt like wringing their necks when they took too long or whatever uh, 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 deal it was. A few years ago in Pakistan, lawyers were being put into prison. Uh, the jokes then wouldn't have been so funny. And that humour doesn't just reflect inner motives. It doesn't just reflect the joke work. There's also a morality of humour. But sometimes some jokes we find unfunny because of the target. Not because of the joke work. Because we don't think it's right to laugh at these people <coughs> in this way. Now I'm going to finish with a story to illustrate this from Freud, from Freud's life. As I said, Freud lived in Vienna. He spent most of all his adult life, really, his working adult life in Vienna. In the 1930s, a disaster happened to the Jewish community in Vienna. The Nazis from Germany invaded Vienna, took over the whole of Austria, and 
they were welcomed by most of the, the, the Austrian population. Those with a bit of foresight, of the Jews with foresight, had got out earlier. Freud was late. He, did, he didn't get out in time. He had to apply to the Nazi authorities for exit visa for himself, for his wife, and for his children. He, he failed to, to get exit visas for his mother or his sisters. They all went to the camps and were murdered. And he managed to get the exit visa, and he signed the papers. And as part of the papers, he had to sign that he'd been well treated. And when he came back, he told his son, his oldest son, that yes, he'd signed the papers, and he'd made a joke. He'd signed them and said, I can thoroughly recommend the Gestapo. And his son, Oliver, believed for many years that his father had told this joke and uh, that uh, bravely he had made the joke and signed the papers. A few years back, the papers surfaced, and of course there was no joke. Freud hadn't written this. Freud knew that if he'd written something like that, uh, not only would he have been thrown in prison, but his family would have and none would have slept. But nevertheless, he felt the urge to tell a joke, to rebel against that situation. And he knew, knew that you can't just think a joke, you have to tell a joke, it's social. And he told his son this joke. He told it as if this is what he'd done, not just what he thought. The joke would have been spoiled if he just said, oh, I thought it, but of course I didn't do it. Now, I don't think the new discovery that Troy told in line to his son spoils the joke, the bitterness of the joke, the seriousness of the joke, or detracts from Freud himself. Because Freud knew that a good joke does depend on some deceit. And sometimes the deceit is worthwhile if you mock an authority which should be mocked, but which is so powerful that you're scared to mock. But I shall leave that story to you to interpret it in your own ways. Okay. Oh, I got on. I knew I would. Slightly too long. We'll have a very short break. Okay. In this lecture, I shall be talking about another of my favourites, William James, who lived from 1842 to 1910. Died much earlier than Freud, born before Freud. I'm going to, he, he, he had a, quite a vast oeuvre. I'm going to talk mainly about his psychological work, his study of experience, and why he really was in some ways an establishment figure, but a, a rebel. And his example, if we take him seriously, it raises the question of whether psychology should be a discipline or whether we should intellectually try and rebel against any discipline. Well, I'll say a few words about his background. He, he came from a large, well-off, very eccentric family who he wrote about it, always arguing at meal times and discussing things. A uh, very open natured family. His father, Henry James Senior, uh, he liked to think of himself as a theologian, a philosopher, a bit of a mystic. Uh, he actually was a businessman, but he wrote and paid for his own publications. 
And he was constantly traveling from the United States, if anybody lived on the uh, east coast of the United States, and constantly traveling back to Europe. You, you haven't missed anything, I've just given the summary and I'm now saying who William James was. So it was a slightly bohemian family, but well to do because of the father it was quite a well off businessman. Travelling to Europe gave the young children a distance, uh, a, a vision, and uh, the young William spoke and read French and German perfectly. His brother, Henry James, was a great novelist. Henry James wrote, he's not quite so popular amongst your generation, but uh, many of his books were made into rather period films, and practically all of them starred Helen Bonham Carter. Now, I exaggerate. Well, William was uh, educated at Harvard Medical School, trained to be a doctor, but he never stuck to a single discipline. He had the sort of mind which always would hop, go from one thing to another, do one thing and want to do another. He went from the physiology department to the psychology department to the philosophy department and then he got fed up with the, the whole of Harvard and left university to become an independent writer, living on his inheritance and living on his writing. And throughout his adult life, he was interested, genuinely interested, in mysticism, mystical ideas, and science. He's a strange combination of very down-to-earth, common-sense view, but also a sympathy with those who were more mystical had more flights of uh, religious fantasy than he did. And his great psychological work, which he took years writing, was The Principles of Psychology, <coughs> which he published in 1890, right, when he was at Harvard. It was his first book he took years and it's a great great book in psychology if you ask notable psychologists what are the great books in psychology most would say the principles of psychology and it's been worked out but it, it's probably over the years the most read work in the history of psychology, at least read by professional psychologists. And why, you might say? Well, you would expect a book of the fame of this book, and which is so widely read as this book, either to have an original methodology or an original theory. But this book has neither. It has something possibly even more valuable. It has an original outlook, a warm-hearted human outlook. We'll come on to this. Now, James always surprises. For years before I read him properly, I had the wrong impression of him, totally. The text from 1890 was written at a time when psychology was becoming established as an independent discipline. Remember of Wundt establishing psychology in Germany? Well, James was the first professor of psychology in the United States at Harvard. And the German model of universities was spreading throughout Europe. And the German model is you didn't have an overall university and everyone 
sharing in the university, you had different disciplines. And you went to a particular subject to study that subject, and you would be taught by experts in that subject. So students and professors were specialists. As you are today, you've all chosen to do social psychology, and the majority of you probably in all your time at the university are doing nothing but social psychology. If you have to take a course out of social psychology, you probably resent it. This is the German model which is affecting you. And university teachers were now being expected not just to be transmitters of knowledge, giving lectures, telling young people, uh, giving them the wisdom of their experience, but they were also meant to be producers of knowledge, publishing, and this still affects us, writing. And what students learn, it's the same what you expect to learn, you expect to learn a discipline. And you expect, as part of a discipline, to learn theory and method. You've all chosen to come and do psychology, haven't you? As part of doing psychology, you all recognise that you have to do statistics a large amount of it. Who enjoys doing statistics? Sorry, you must have been asleep. You couldn't have heard the question. Who enjoys doing statistics? No one. But you've chosen to do psychology. And you know that you have to do statistics and learn the methods. Wow. Well, what is going on? James would have had something to say about this. And why do you do statistics? Because not only do you learn what psychology is as a discipline, you have to learn how to do it. This is part of your education, how to do psychology. And to do psychology, you have to learn how to do statistics, how to feed your little numbers into the SPSS and then produce the tables of data. Oh, isn't it fun? And stu those of you, if any of those of you cover the job which I have, I don't mean literally my wish to be uh, lecturers, you have to learn how to do research. You have to take your PhD and do research, use proper methods. And this was just starting, this pattern, which we take for granted today, was really just growing in the late 19th century, and when James was writing at the start of it for American universities. The first professor of psychology, when psychology was becoming a discipline, training its students, training in methods, and so on. And he wrote the first major textbook. He was the first professor of psychology at Harvard and the opportunity to build the discipline of psychology on the German model and, and, and James was in a wonderful position because he had lots of German contacts. He was constantly spending summers in Germany and he could talk and write with the German professors. He actually built the first psychology laboratory in the United States. And there's some dispute, actually, whether he might have built his laboratory before Wundt built his. And James, William James, the great William James, actually has some claim to, being, to, to building the first psychology, dedicated psychology laboratory in the world. And he's published his textbook. It's a way of influence students. There's new journals growing up for psychology. He's, he's published some of his chapters of his textbook in the new journals. So here you expect a man, because of where he was, what he was doing, to be a founder of psychology and to be one of the great figures of psychology because he organised psychology. Did he help? He 
hated all these developments. He didn't use his laboratory. He set it up and he thought, oh, I can't use it. Oh, do all these stupid things. And in fact, he hired, he brought someone over from Germany, Professor Munsterberg, to teach practicals and methods just the sorts of courses he didn't want to teach. And shortly after his textbook was published, he resigned from it. But I can't do this anymore, he said. All these practicals, all these students to teach and so on. And why? He disliked the very idea of academic disciplines. Because where you have a discipline which tells you what you've got to learn to be a proper psychologist and what you've got to learn to do to be a pro proper psychologist, you have a loss of freedom. You have to pick up a standard academic view say, this is how we do academic research. You've got to value methods over ideas. And you will train postgraduates. And Mr. Jack from James Mad to do very small bits of research. Look, it still goes on today. Indeed, it's even stronger than in James's time. Most of you have only done psychology courses when come, coming here. You could have done courses. How, how many of you have only done psychology courses? Oh no, of course, in the first year you have to do one psychology one. How many of you are only doing psychology courses this year? Quite a lot of you. Why? There's a whole world out there. You could have chosen to study other things, but it's as if you're being constrained to be a proper psychologist. You've only got to look at the, this part of the world. And you put up with statistics and the practicals, which are telling you how to do research. And you have to read. How many of you have read, been told to read papers, and you come away from a paper and think, this is trivial. This is so small. And I've done put your hands up. Let me tell you, I often come away when I'm from reading things like that. And so did the great William James. So you can gather here that Principles of Psychology is not a standard <coughs> textbook, even though it's the greatest one ever written. He knew all the theories and the psychological work of his time. He really was an expert. He knew the German work, he knew the French work, he even knew the Italian work. And he wasn't, but he wasn't training his students to become his psychologists. That wasn't his aim. He wanted them to think, to think about themselves, think about experience. above all, these new methods were developing, experimental methods, and James was sceptical of them. Basically, he didn't like them. Throughout this book, if you read between the lines, you can see he's rebelling against Wundt, who he considered to be a real pompous and he felt most experiments were actually becoming real, some were, some were, but most of them were becoming so trivial and boring. And it, here's a very Jamesian sentence. He, he, this is about the new <coughs> German experimental method. He's not saying, oh, it's wonderful. It's scientific. He says, it taxes the patients to the utmost. 
and could hardly have arisen in a country whose natives <coughs> could be bored. That's uh, he's saying how boring this world are. And this is okay, you can't <coughs> fall it off your chairs with laughter. This is a joke. This in the nineteenth century was a very rude joke. But he also agrees. But consciousness or studying what people think, what's going on in our minds is important. Actually, he didn't quite put it that way, the study of consciousness. He didn't like the word consciousness after a while. He thought because people think consciousness is a thing. And rather like Reed and Locke's ideas, he said consciousness isn't a thing. You can't pick up consciousness. We are conscious, conscious and we do things. And he also thought physiology was important. He was a trained as a doctor, as a physiologist. But, above all, you don't need a boring experimental method to study how we think, what goes on in our minds. And, indeed, why we think. And what we're doing when we think. In some ways, James's approach was anti-methodological. Ernest, Ernest Hilgard, who was a much later American psychologist and a history, historian of psychology, said that James's approach was to psychologize rather than to do modern psychology. He wasn't learning the methods which you are being taught and then applying. He was psychologizing, which is much more informed. What, what, what did Hilgard mean? mean? He meant that James, and this is again a, a quote from Hilgard, he reflected on ordinary observations about how people behave, what you do, and he tried to provide plausible explanations about all about what we do. And he rejected any full-blown discipline methodology, anything which said, unless you follow these methodological procedures, unless you do these sorts of experiments or these sorts of observation, we will discount any information. He rejected that. Don't constrain your thinking. Widen your thinking. And the result of his psychologizing, which is to think about and speculate about the psychology of people, was a full-bodied, warm-hearted psychology. He wasn't converting people into things or laboratory animals. He was trying to understand people as people and what we do. And also, this wasn't naive psychology. He knew all the big theories. He'd read them all. He bored himself to death with them. And he sometimes took ideas from them. But he wasn't dominated by them. Now, let's start off with discovering what's in the mind. Introspectionists, like Woods, try to discover mental states. Different states of mind to categorize them and say, when you're doing this, or when you're seeing this, or when you're wanting this, you have this particular state of mind which can be identified and labelled. And the assumption are that there are different mental states for different actions or different psychological functions. When you're wanting something, when you're willing something to happen, the act of will according to, to want was one mental state. Uh, he called it innovation, not innovation, innervation. Uh, 
when you're perceiving something, you're, you're in another mental state if you're looking at it, or if you're thinking or reflecting or in emotion. And James said, building a psychology on trying to classify different mental states, identifying and classifying this mental state and distinguishing it from that mental state. And some cognitive psychologists do something very similar these days. James said, this misunderstood the nature of the mind. Because he came and said that one basic fact about the mind, about the way we are, about the way we exist in the world, about our minds work, a basic fact which he said most psychologists were ignoring. And his basic fact is a very simple one. It's that our mental states are continuous. Our mind runs on. It's not comprised of separate mental states. We don't go from an act of willing, uh, sorry, a mental state of willing to a mental state of doing. But I'm willing myself. Oh, yes, do it, do it, do it. And now I do it. It's not like that. Our men mental states are like rivers, they're like streams, they flow, our minds flow. Sometimes we're in charge of our mind, directing it this way, and then we find it directing us another way. As the thoughts roll in and roll out, a river or stream, these are the metaphors by which it, our mind, is most naturally described. The stream of thought, of consciousness or subjective life. And I think everyone who reads that passage will say yes. There are times when our minds just roll on and find ourselves thinking of one thing and this leads to another thing and, and another thing and we're not aware of sudden jumps. The mind just goes. What James was doing was looking at his own mind and telling us to look at our minds and see how thoughts drift from topic to topic. And there are not these sudden breaks as if we're going from one state of mind to another state of mind. And there's an important implication. Now this it's going to get a bit tricky, and I want you to concentrate, because it relates to perception. <coughs> but James said, if our thoughts are a stream of flowing, there's no actual present moment. You could say, well, how are our minds that we have... It's a series of present moments. We think of this, then this, then this, then this, then this. It's a series of present moments. It's like uh, of an old uh, photographic film. It's a frame on frame on frame on frame. Or if you stop a video, it's that's, that uh, freeze frame and that one and so on. And James said, no, no, no. If it really is a stream, there is no present moment. Always the past and the future are with us uh, and there is no pure present. But to make sense of our worlds, make sense of what is happening now, we must always see what is happening now in terms of what has just happened and what is about to happen. So there's no consciousness of present. He talks of specious present doesn't exist in consciousness. Look, can I, this, this is an abstract idea, I'll try and give a demonstration. Watch me, and as you're watching me, pay attention to your own minds and think about each moment you're watching. 
Okay, are you ready? Right. You saw someone moving across. You were looking at me. At any given moment, you didn't have just a clear visual image of that moment and that moment alone. So as I was doing that, I was in motion for doing that and doing that. And you were always aware it was the same person who had been stood here and who walked here and who walked there. You couldn't say, ah, oh, I remember just at that instance, all I was seeing was one visual image. You were making sense of what was occurring, and to make sense, it was all. I was always walking forward until I stopped, and it didn't surprise you when I stopped. And you knew who I was, where I'd come from, and this is what James meant. There is no present; it's always the past and the future there. This was somewhat similar to what Gibson would say. Remember, I said uh, the criticism of uh, of Locke's ideas that. We search for things, we make sense, we put together information. Any perception of an object is complex, and this is a quote from James, part of the complexity is the echo of the objects just past, and in a less degree perhaps, the foretaste of those just to arrive. Do you all understand what, what the point he's making? Well, but if we can t consider our thinking as a stream, we're never there actually in the present. We're always moving from past to future. Do you understand it? And there's an implication here. For all those theories of perception I've talked about, if past, present, and future contain within an act of perception, if we look at an object, and to make sense of it, we have to combine the past with what we think is about to happen, then perception can never be simple, as Locke presumed. And James explicitly criticizes Locke's theory of perception on the, and those of other atomists. Perception, as Gibson was to say, is complicated. It's not based on simple atoms. And also consciousness, more generally, is never seen. Especially since our thoughts are running into, into one another. And we all we often find ourselves doing more than one thing. We're not just thinking or seeing, willing, wanting something to happen, but we're always acting in the world, doing things. We do things as we see, as we think, as we see, wish. I wasn't sure what I was going to say next. But then I found myself that my hand was on my forehead. I don't remember putting it there. I didn't deliberately put it there. It just went there. And as I was thinking, it was rubbing itself. You're, you're just rubbing yourself there. Oh, you've just folded your hands. And, and you, you've just, this is going on all the time as we're thinking. As our minds are, are rolling forward, so our bodies are doing little things. And James said, so much of what we do is habit. So much of what we do is also practical. When we're looking at things, we're trying to do something. You can't find this out in the artificial experiments which Volk was doing. And sometimes, our experiences, our consciousness, is limited. 
and that we don't have a separate consciousness before each act. Sometimes we just act without thinking. It's as if our bodies take over. And he gave a famous, a famous example in the principles, which has been much discussed, much read. And remember, James lived in the time long before central heating, and he lived in the west coast of the north uh, of the United States in New England, when the winters would be cold. How do you get out of a nice warm bed? on a cold morning. You lie there and say, I really must get up. I can't spend the whole day in bed. And you don't. And then, suddenly, we more often than not get up without any struggle or decision at all. A fortunate lapse of consciousness occurs. Inhibitory ideas suddenly cease, and suddenly we find ourselves out of bed. Has that ever occurred to any of you? you just, yes, you, you just you have. Why you've got up that moment remains a mystery. You've been lying there trying to get up, and suddenly you're out. And this gives the lie to any psychological uh, 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 account which says before you act, you must will your body to act. But sometimes the body carries you forward. Now, in the, what has James done in this description? And this is what Hilgard meant by psychologising. He's criticised what was then a standard psychological view that every conscious act is a conscious experience. But he hasn't based his criticism on doing an experiment. He hasn't said, oh, I'm now going to do an experiment to prove uh, Wilhelm Wundt's colleagues at Leipzig wrong. No. He takes an example from everyday life, a familiar example. This is what Hilgard meant about psychologizing. He looks at a, an example. When he's talking about the importance of habits, he has another example. Because he sort of says our bodies have habits, and we're often not aware of our habits. Putting on our socks, trousers, or underpants. We do it every day. Those of us who wear trousers. We don't think in the morning, oh, shall I put my right leg in first or my left leg in first? We just do it. It happens. But if you ask someone, do you put your right leg in or your left leg in first? He said, but most people don't know. Few men can tell offhand which sock, shoe, or trouser leg they put on first. To remember, they must mentally rehearse it. Even that is often insufficient. The act must sometimes be performed. Now again, he's not done an experiment. He's given a description which I think most of us can recognise, and recognise ourselves in that description. And he's pointed to something very important, that so much of what we do is just habit, routine, and without thinking. And our minds are carrying us forward, even as we're putting on our clothes and getting dressed, having got out of bed. So, these stories, these little talk stories, there are examples of psychologizing, but they make theoretical points about the nature of the mind and about the nature of life. But not all acts have conscious mental states, and we can act with semi-awareness. That our consciousness is complicated. It's not just simple mental states. James, in one of his later books, 
was delighted, and there's a, a sense of ne 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 ne, which he enjoys, when he quotes Wundt after many years of experiments, where Wundt really seems to come to the conclusion that experiments, his all these experiments, were very good. Wundt, <coughs> this is the quote, if asked, if I was asked, what have you learnt from all the experiments, this is Wundt saying this, I would reply that they have given me an entirely new idea of the nature and connection of our inner processes. I attained an insight into the close union of all those psychic functions, usually separated by artificial abstractions and names, such as ideation, feeling and will. And I saw the individuality and inner homogeneity of the mental life. Ah, oh, so still he's pompous. But what James is saying, he's saying exactly what James knew all along, but we don't have separate mental states. And if you want to label one state ideation, another state feeling, and you think you go from ideation to feeling to will or whatever, you just misunderstood the nature of conscious life. And Wundt is, James is quoting Wundt as saying, after all these years of my experiments, they've shown me that, the, that uh, mental life is too complicated for all this naming. And James said, well, I knew that all along. And that the notion of distinct mental image was a self-deception and a fiction. And that's why James enjoyed quoting Wundt saying, well, it's obvious. Because James was saying, fine, Wundt said that the one thing he learned from all his experiences is that consciousness, our thinking, is like a stream. Things roll into one another and you can't disentangle. And the function of consciousness, why do we have it? It's to help us in the world. We might be able to put on our trousers every morning without thinking. But we couldn't have bought those trousers in the first place if we didn't. And we wouldn't be able to put them in the wash basket and clean them again if we just had habits. We need more to life, to organise complicated life, than just acting on the thinking. Now, why was James such a big rebel against this new discipline of psychology? Well, first of all, I think it was impatience. And a feeling of intellectual freedom. If he felt he had to do the same thing again and again and again, just varying one variable each time, doing another close experiment, he would get impatient, thinking, this isn't very interesting. As all of you, I probably, probably imagine at some time or other when you're reading an experimental report or academic report, you say, oh, this is so tedious, this is just going round in circles. James felt that. But also there's something, I think, more profound. The very notion of an academic discipline means you constrain yourselves. You think, well, I'm studying social psychology. I'm a social psychologist. Therefore, I have to be an expert in psychology and social psychology. There was a, a very great cricket writer and Marxist historian called C.L.R. James, who once said, he that only knows of cricket knows not cricket. 
because his idea was to understand cricket, you have to understand the history, and particularly the history of the British Empire. But you can use that same to anything. You can say, he or she that only understands, only knows of psychology, knows not of psychology. Or know, they might know the discipline of psychology, but they do, will not know the real subject matter of psychology. To understand properly, you need to read widely. And if you constrain your reading just to a discipline, you will think in narrow ways. And look, Wundt's disciplined way of thinking, his experiments, his hundreds and hundreds of experiments, have led to the same identical conclusion, but not as well put, as James's psychologizing. And this happened because Wundt couldn't find what he was looking for. And that leads to a big question. I know my answer to this, but all of you should think about this question and attend to the question. Should psychology be a discipline with an accepted method or even a portfolio of accepted methods? Or is each accepted method a constraint which tells you, do this and look for this? And don't do that. We don't look for anything more. The more disciplined you get in your way of being a psychologist, does this mean the more narrow your thinking, the more constrained your thinking? And if psychology isn't to be a discipline, to be disciplined in this way, should it attract free spirits like James? who will psychologize, think about psychological questions, look at people and trying to be humane and understanding, and rather like Freud did the same, but refuse to be restricted by method. Who will say, yes, I have to learn all these statistics, I have to do all these methods courses, but what I'm interested in will always be what the statistics, what the methods courses overlook. Because there always will be something which is overlooked. It's not for me to find out what is overlooked, what is extra. It's always for you, for, for the next generation, as it was for James and his generation. Okay. Questions? No? I think next week aren't we going to have a discussion about jokes as well? <laughs>